After Hurricane Melissa's devastating impact, new data from a recent regional study with participation from U.S. scientists points to worrying trends about the strength and frequency of Caribbean hurricanes. Joining us now is climate specialist and senior lecturer from the Department of Physics from UWI, Dr. Jakaya Campbell. He's going to break down the study for us. Doc, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I, I am good. Well, you know, <laughs> ay, 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 ay. I want to say... We've been hearing climate change and the impact of climate change for so long. Uh, is Melissa one of those checkpoints that should say to everyone, it's not a joke, people, this is happening? I would say yes, but I would say yes with a small caveat. Okay. The caveat being no one event can actually say to you that this is all that climate change is. Mm -hmm. you, you, what you want to do is build that evidence. And so far, there's a series of studies that have been building that evidence. And a part of that evidence comes from the mere fact that what fuels storms are warm waters. Mm -hmm. And what climate, the climate change we speak about, the primary driver for that is anthropogenic change, which means human-induced climate forcing. Mm -hmm. And that forcing lead, led our, our sea surface temperatures to be about 1.5 degrees warmer than they would have been normally. Mm. And that also precipitated a, a greater depth of warming. So if you look at it, if you're warm at the surface and you, you, you know, wind blows on it, it gets a little bit cool. Mm. But if you're warm at the surface and warm all the way down, as you pull that heat out, there's something to replace it. And so what that did was fuel a storm that literally a monster. sat for, mm -hmm. I think we had advance notice. And Days. the problem is, we, even with that advance notice, even with the preparation, even with the brilliant work of the Met Service advising everybody, even with the brilliant work of all the other departments actually saying to people, here's where we go, here's what we do, that advance notice, if you compare this to Gilbert, Mm -hmm. Gilbert, the warning was not necessarily always there. Mm -hmm. um, technology was not as advanced as it is. And even with that warning, you'll hear persons who survived both telling you that this one mm -hmm. was far worse. You mentioned human-induced yes. temperatures, yes. warming, warmer yes. temperatures. Not to be confused, let's talk a little bit about the science with a man-made storm. Can we talk about that just for a little bit before we head into this study and what the findings are? Because... I hear people talking about, oh, this, uh, this storm was man-made. Mm. How does one man make a hurricane? All right. So let, let's toss this out there. You, there are technology and there is technology at play that you can actually, um, there's some cloud dispersion or cloud seeding. So mm -hmm. you can actually do something. But there, this one has absolutely nothing to do with that. The science dictates that when your ocean temperatures are about 28.5 degrees, that is sufficient enough to facilitate a storm. A part of our problem was that there was a high pressure system in the northern parts of the US pushing in. And there was another system that Melissa literally came into the Caribbean Sea and then went, I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. It sat for a little bit. I remember we spoke about as warm waters. And it, it, it kept builds. building and mm -hmm. building and building and building and building. And remember, at one kilometers per hour over all of those waters, and if you look at the track, you'll realize it came this way and it curved back. Mm -hmm. And so it, when it came and it sat just a little bit to the west of us. Taunting us. The, the system that was there holding it in place shifted a little. Mm -hmm. And as that shift, system shifted, it shifted with us. There are some key things that I want persons to realize. The Met Service had radar which gave us some advance notice. Um, there, they, they, the planes that flew in to give you mm -hmm. a, a look at what the storm had is. Had to come out. Had to come out. Um, and to, f to think that something like this, to even burgeon on the thought of this was something man-made, I, I, I will call it a coping strategy, a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's almost nature could not be this mm, devastating. Gotcha. Mm. Can't wrap your mind around it. Yes. So, um, yeah, which is why scientists like you are studying it. It's a rapid analysis of, of, of Melissa. Is, is it because the technology now affords you the capacity to do so? Not necessarily. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's as you say, it was a partnership. So we were partnered with the World Weather Attribution mm -hmm. um, Group. And what they do, <coughs> think about it for 
a couple of days after Melissa, a lot of us didn't have light or power. Mm -hmm. um, so we had scientists that were based in the, across Europe. We had scientists based in the US. We had scientists from Africa. And everybody pooled together. And, and while it was there forming, what the World what, uh, Weather Attribution does is that they look for um, the climate change factors in extreme events. And a hurricane is an extreme event. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's why, given the timeline, Melissa was the 28th at this timeline for us to have that. That's why it's called a rapid assessment. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned the word rapid, and I'm going to play on that word. Melissa is one of the storms that when you talk about, and it's, it's not about an assessment, a rapid intensification. It means, so planes will go in th every three hours, every six hours, and they try to determine what the strength of the hurricane is. So they're sensing, and as they sense, they go back in. And what you want is within a 24 hours, you call it a rapid intensification. If the storm does not increase by about 50, 57 miles per hour, in, in, you know, in, in terms of intensity, the winds don't increase by that in a 24 hour period, then you consider it normal. If it does exceed that, it's a rapid intensifying storm. Mm -hmm. Melissa went up by, I'm gonna keep it in, in miles, um, twice that in 18 hours. Wow. So it went from, let's say, 80 to 100 and something miles, over 160 miles per hour mm -hmm. in less than 18 hours. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. Nothing. So, and as, uh, there's nothing. So doc, this is, a, this is what you call a precedent. It is, and yes. Based on what you've seen and studied and all the information you pull together, you say we, we may see more like this based on what you see with climate change patterns? So it's, it, it, we may see more like this, but the climate change pattern of this is suggesting, one, the winds that we got from Melissa are about you know, five miles more stronger than they would have been under normal condition. Mm -hmm. And somebody might say five miles doesn't mean anything, but imagine somebody tapping on you for six hours with mm -hmm. a little bit more intensity rather than just gently resting a hand on you. Mm -hmm. It may not seem significant, but some studies have suggested that for every one mile you increase, the, your devastation goes up by this cool. factor. Absolutely. Um, and That's so, a correlation. ironically and interestingly, there is another piece of work that we were a part of with the Oxford University that um, designed a tool for the Planning Institute of Jamaica. And within that tool, um, storm surge is a part of that tool. And when we look at storm surge, we, storm surge comes from these extreme events. Mm -hmm. And when we project into the future on the climate change, way into the future, it's suggesting that the Black River era would have actually gotten about 2.4 meters, which is equivalent to 13 feet of storm surge. Melissa came with 13, six, with 13, 13 to 16 feet. feet, which means the science is there. So those distant events, those events we thought future were- is The future the future is here. The future is almost here. A lot of conversations are now happening. We've spoken to um, experts about um, sustainable planning and, and taking into consideration the fact that we are susceptible and vulnerable where we are. What are some of the key takeaways, Doc, for us coming out of something like Melissa? All right, so as I indicated, the Planning Institute has a tool. It's called JSRAT, JS mm -hmm. which stands for Jamaica Systemic Risk Assessment Tool. Mm -hmm. um, and it layers all our infrastructure, so the roads, the buildings, the power lines, um, and it has a GDP quotient tied to it. So take, for example, how much of your GDP moves from point A to point B, and then it layers that with your hazards. So your flooding, your beat from your river, your, your storm surge, all of that. And then it says, if you have this hazard, what can we do to adapt or what can we do to mitigate, mitigate. its mm -hmm. effect? And so, you know, there are physical structures we can do, there are ecosystem-based approaches we can take. So the science is there. So it's, it's about using that science effectively. To inform. Uh, to inform. And as science evolves, we can't say we have something that is here and static because if climate continues changing, we have to ensure our tools are constantly updated. Mm -hmm. And so how do we answer even in terms of housing infrastructure? Are we building back on the coast? Are we, you know, what, what inferences can we draw from the conclusions that have come out of this study about how we build back. We're talking about building back better. <laughs> yes. But if we are predicting what you just said, yeah, yeah. we can't build back nothing down there. You, we can actually. And, and here, here's why I say that. Um, 
it happens to be the area that 70 percent supports a lot of our agriculture. 70% of the persons there are dependent on agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, it's a water rich area because the water from there gets fed across other parishes. It is an area that is rich in biodiversity and it's just about where we build and using the information we have, the risk we know mm -hmm. and trying to build to avoid or mitigate the impacts of those things. Yeah. Where we build and how we build. Yes. A board, board is not a viable. A board can be a viable. Really? It can be viable. In a Cat 5? It can be viable. I, I have an anecdotal evidence. I, have a, I, I was lucky enough to meet my great grandmother. And she survived in the 1950s. Her roof was taken off in the hurricane from 1950s. That roof was put back on. And, it, and I know persons may look at hurricane strapping as weird. It's a wooden structure. But that roof was put back and on in a government-funded thing at a time with proper hurricane strapping. It survived Gilbert and it survived every other hurricane since that period. Wow. It's never been retrofitted. Wow. wow. So the, the technology exists. It's just about whether or not... Accessing the information. Yes, and to the appropriate standards. One key thing to note, battening down in a storm is necessary. Mm -hmm. Protecting windows is necessary. There are too many, too many, too many of the instances I heard persons windows getting coming in. coming in. So battening down is essential because the force of the wind will actually cause those windows to kick. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I saw? I saw a, a house in one of the affected areas. They put rope, was it, yes. or mm -hmm. straps mm -hmm. yeah. and sandbags, mm -hmm. on the, and sandbags on the ground, and tied the structure to the sandbags. Roof? Still there. Still there. Still there. Engineering 103. No, okay, no. 101, but we have the history. We know what oh, to nice. do. We know what to do. And we have to protect ourselves. Thank you so much. No problem. Doc, for speaking with us this morning. That's yes. an interesting time and an interesting job you have. Thank you for sharing with us. No problem. <laughs> Climate specialist and senior lecturer at Department of Physics from UA, Dr. Jakaya Campbell. After the break, we're discussing car insurance after hurricane damage. Mm. Stay tuned for that. <laughs>